and I think it's the reason that this is uh, on the agenda today, is that electricity distribution is at a crisis mode. And that crisis is caused by renewable energy. And to some extent, we don't know what we don't know. So we don't know how big it is. It's a little bit like uh, someone described this morning, it's a little bit like a uh, frog in a bucket of nice uh, tepid water. Uh, um, but unfortunately, there's a fire underneath and, uh, and, and that's going to become boiling water uh, very quickly. So w we really are in a crisis and, and, and things have changed. Uh, those of us who have been coming to these conferences for a while, this would never have been on the agenda 10 years ago. We never would have been talking about renewable energy. And even a few years ago, we were talking of renewable targets of 10, 20%, and we were talking out to 2030, 2040, and, and, and those sort of time frames. Things have changed. I was talking to my colleague who, uh, who runs our business in Germany the other day, and last month, Germany had two full days where all of their energy was provided by renewable. Now, some of you may say that's not even possible. It's certainly, no one would have even thought of it a few years ago. But yes, two full days, 100%, a combination of mainly um, some storage, uh, uh, wind of course, and, 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 and solar. And, and uh, as Gavin said earlier, um, Germany has been right at the forefront of uh, solar and it's not as attractive for solar as, uh, as, as say, Australia. And, and, and the other thing that's happening um, is that the, world, the, the world's politicians have tried since Kyoto and so forth and Copenhagen was supposed to be an attempt to, as a world to try to get some form of direction and policy in, in renewables. And that never happened. The politicians couldn't agree. But what has happened is either individuals, consumers like you and me, or sometimes governments, have actually progressed that anyway. They've, they've said we can't have 300 milligrams of, uh, of, of uh, dust and pollution in the air. We've got to do something about our air quality in Beijing or Hong Kong or, 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 or wherever. Or, or, or people have wanted to be independent. You know, I've got three kilowatts of, uh, of, of PV on the roof of my house. I would love to be totally independent and, I, and I'm going to need uh, NEC to help me um, become totally independent of my distribution company. And that's, that's one of the things that is, uh, is, is actually happening and, and driving things. But it's causing, as, as a panel, uh, we, we sort of summarised that it's, it's causing two major crises. As, as an end user, um, so if I'm a household with renewables, whether it's PV or some other source, and storage and so forth, there is no one that really has a smart control system. I don't know until my energy bill comes in, really, if I, how, how much I've generated and how much I've taken off, off the grid. I really don't know. Uh, you know. There's no smart system that controls it all for me. And secondly, because we've got so much renewable in the grid, and in my country where, where I live uh, about a half of the year, um, there's over a million households now with PV on the roof. Now, many of the towns and cities, uh, not just like Gavin talked about, but many of the big towns and cities are at 25, 30% of every household in the city has got PV on the roof. And the problem that that's causing for the energy companies, the distribution companies especially, is the electrical engineers are focusing on grid stability, you know, voltage fluctuations, you know, transformer stepping. You know, instead of changing uh, every day, every week or month or something like that with some, uh, some changes, now it's happening tens and tens and tens of times a day. Right? And you can't, afford, you can't afford to send people out to, to check that. But what's it doing to your asset, the asset that you thought was going to last 40 years? Maybe that asset's only going to last five or ten years now because of, because of all those uh, conditions that are now on the network. And the systems, you know, I know there's exceptions, but the systems basically aren't in place. So 
to, hand, to handle that. And that's why we think, uh, that's why we think we're at a crisis. So let me, uh, let, let me introduce and, and ask uh, each of our panellists if, if they could uh, comment to those uh, points and talk about uh, in, in their particular area and, and so forth, uh, what they uh, will, will address from that. So, uh, Yugendo Vashista from SP Osnet in Australia, Singapore Power Osnet in Australia, is the manager of distribution energy and resources and also innovation. So he's looking at the regulation and deregulated um, businesses uh, around this. Gavin Shearing, who you've uh, just heard of, is business development and planning at uh, Horizon Energy. And uh, Waikang Lu um, from Hong Kong Electric is uh, manager of regulator regulatory and policy. And last but not least, Manesh uh, Kaliswal from uh, NEC is the head of Smart, Smart Energy uh, Business Unit uh, down here in uh, Singapore. So gentlemen, if I could uh, perhaps go in that order, if that... Uh, is okay, and if you could give us a brief perspective, and uh, we'll try to keep the time on uh, managing renewables. Yep. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, I mean, SPOSnet Australia is. I'm talking not as a transmission company, but as one of the distributor uh, distribution companies. Uh, we are also getting this solar PV penetration. Not to an extent like South, uh, the, like Western Australia, uh, but we 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 don't have that much information and modeling at that low voltage level. Uh, to and if this percentage goes the way it is going, there will be issues uh, which which we have to deal with with the penetration of solar PV. However. We, SPO's net is trialing the residential storage um, uh, system uh, with PV. Uh, so we, we are thinking that, you know, like they, they, this is a solution, uh, especially for us at the moment, is a managing the peak demand, uh, which can help utilities um, in, in some way. So we, as a utility, we are trial, we, we are going with the PV connections. We know which direction it is going. We know the technical challenges it is po it is going to pose um, to to a distribution uh, network service provider. Um, we also we are working with the customers on a residential storage side, and as I said yesterday, we are also uh, trialing a megawatt size battery. At this point in time, is is for network demand management, but who knows you know which way the network will grow. Uh, I mean, we are not. At this point, we are not using the or doing this trial to to actually smooth smoothen the power supply because of the renewal uh, fluctuations. But it all depends in the matter of time, and this trial will tell us how quick the intelligent inverter uh, the response can be uh, to to address the power system issues as well as the issues which will come from the integration of P uh, renewable energy. Thank you. So my name is Gavin Shearing, as you, for most of you who are here for the last session would be aware. Um, in Horizon Power, what, what we're finding is uh, there are systems within our network which are actually already at their peak. Uh, not every system, but a large number. These tended to be the systems that were larger um, in terms of uh, number of customers, particularly residential, and therefore it was reasonably cheap to put solar panels on a roof there were good government subsidies in the past to do that, and there was a constant price paid no matter where you were. Um, so we implemented a change in that policy, which meant that we paid more in the towns where it cost us more, we paid less in the towns where it cost us less. Um, therefore, um, we actually want people to put renewable energy in their systems, in their houses, and that's actually a benefit for the power utility as well as the customer. Um, in doing that, however, we've, we've effectively stopped some customers in certain areas unless they can provide the short-term storage. Uh, now, there is not really a product in the market that's for a customer to do that. So we're working with large multinationals to effectively do that now. And one hopes that within the next year or two, there will be products in the market that will provide that at a customer level. Uh, the next step, one hopes, then, is that um, some of those products could actually be put in the network itself. So rather than saying to the customer, you install it at your cost, 
we could actually say to the customer, we'll install it at our cost, but we'll pay you less for the electricity you generate because we're providing that, that service. If you provide that service, we'll pay you the full price. So they're the sort of discussions that are happening in the early, early days. Um, but uh, as the technology matures and, and the prices come down, then one would expect that that will all resolve. I think uh, in, in Hong Kong, we face uh, uh, completely uh, different pictures. In Hong Kong, uh, we are a very small city with uh, 1,100 uh, square kilometer. We have only limited flat land for development. Uh, most of the buildings are high-rise buildings. Actually, it's, uh, Hong Kong is the, uh, the city with the most uh, high-rise buildings in the world, uh, almost doubles that of uh, New York City. So in, in Hong Kong, with uh, limited land, it is hard to build a rooftop PV in a high-rise building. There's a physical limit, geographical limit, Another issue is uh, Hong Kong property price is so high. We are talking about uh, 10,000 US dollar per square meter for a high-rise residential building. So uh, whether you, you build a rooftop PV for uh, getting small amount of renewable energy or sell it out or rent it out, it's really up to the owner. It is a piece, uh, absolute no business case for our use. So uh, nevertheless, uh, my company has uh, made it, uh, quite a number of initiatives in promoting RE in Hong Kong. We have uh, built the first commercial uh, wind turbine in Nama Island. And also we have built the largest uh, PV system in Hong Kong. We have a one megawatt fin fin PV in our Nama power stations. All the PV panels are built on the power station's building roof. Uh, apart from that, we also promote embedded renewable for our customer. For example, we have a clean energy fund. Uh, for six to seven years, we had sponsored about one million US dollar for schools to install a small-scale RE system at their campus or to carry out some education. I think that there's still a way to go for, for, for Hong Kong. For example, we, we are uh, planning to uh, install a 100 megawatt scale offshore wind farm in Hong Kong waters. Uh, I think uh, for embedded renewable in the city is very difficult in Hong Kong. Uh, we are looking for outlying islands, Hong Kong waters, for more renewable energy installation. Thank you. Um, I come from a vendor company, so whether it is Hong Kong or Australia or Singapore uh, uh, or you know small scale uh, solar PV project or wind, we basically want to offer solution which basically addresses address some of all, uh, you know these needs. And at NEC, um, our, our major focus area is on the energy storage, energy management areas. Uh, we've been doing a lot of projects in in uh, Japan on the energy side and working very closely with uh, uh, some of the uh, you know companies there on the storage front uh, uh, we have a, we are one of the leading manufacturers of uh, lithium ion based electrodes uh, worldwide and we have a joint venture with nissan for which we manufacture uh, lithium ion uh, electrode for the uh, for their ev nissan leaf so uh, when we talk about renewable energy market uh, you know where uh, in, in Asia, back it's picking up. Uh, you know, although the percentage is still quite low, but uh, in next three to five year time period, we expect the percentage of renewable as an overall, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, mix uh, to increase. Uh, we see the need for energy storage to be quite uh, significant. And as Yogendra was mentioning earlier, uh, because of uh, the intermittent nature, because of uh, unpredictability of uh, uh, renewable uh, energy sources, uh, you need power smoothing, and, and that's where energy storage uh, shall play a very important role. Um, although although uh, you guys are doing trials in, in Australia right now, and we'll also be very keen to see the results. Uh, but uh, looking at our experience in the automobile industry, uh, as far as 
uh, lithium ion chemistry is concerned, um, I mean, we are quite excited about this and we think that there are multiple applications, uh, specifically in the smart grid, smart energy area. Thank you, gentlemen. Manish, I wonder if I could ask you a question, and please uh, think of questions from the floor as well, but uh, what form of technology, take your NEC hat off even, but what form of technology do you think is going to be there in 5, 10, 20 years' time in terms of storage? Who's going to win? Well, NEC. <laughs> no, uh, jokes apart. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, uh, you know, when we look at uh, energy storage, uh, there are a few parameters which are very important uh, that uh, we need to consider. Uh, one, definitely price. Uh, you know, if, if, we, if we look at the existing technologies, whether it is lead acid or, or, you know, one of the traditional ones, it's quite cheap now already, right? So anything which is going to be next generation, uh, whether it is lithium ion or sodium ion, or uh, you know uh, other variants in you know, a fuel cell, uh, there will be issues related to price. Uh, second one is power density. Uh, it's going to be a very important uh, uh, parameter while deciding the technology uh, or, or you know chemistry. Uh, life cycle is another important thing. Uh, typically, when we look at uh, lead acid uh, type of uh, chemistry, um, you know we are we'd be lucky if we can get a thousand cycle. Uh, you know assuming one charge discharge per day. But when we are looking at some of the, you know, emerging uh, or, or new battery technologies, we are looking at 4,000, 5,000 cycles plus. And depending on, on the usage, depending on the weather pattern, depending on the, um, you know, the power situation, uh, we can see 10 years plus life cycle. Uh, the other very important factor in, in deciding uh, the, the battery technology is depth of discharge. And uh, typically in lead acid, you will see the depth of discharge is, you know, 50%, 60% at the max, which means that if you are, uh, you know, uh, deploying a, uh, you know, 600 AH battery or, or a 14.4 kilowatt hour battery in a typical telecom environment, you are effectively getting only half of it. Whereas in case of uh, lithium ion based or, you know, the, some of the other next generation uh, based, you get almost 100% depth of discharge. And that's a very big uh, benefit, that's a very big advantage as compared to other technologies. So I think these are some of the few parameters that one should look at while selecting the battery technology. And I've got a question that will uh, be a yes, no or something like that. Is there going to be a breakthrough technology? Lithium ion is, is very good. You look at your iPhone and your iPad and you know the battery in that compared to cell phones of 15 years ago, but is, is there going to be a breakthrough? Is, is it going to come in, uh, in, in some other form of storage uh, outs, outside of the traditional battery, even lithium air, but, but you know, something? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, if, you, if you look at, uh, there are a lot of research uh, that's going on across the globe. Uh, a lot of companies now are getting into the space, and what we are seeing is lithium ion is emerging as one of the leading technologies in this space. There are multiple chemistries of lithium ion which are available. Uh, you know, uh, 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 for example, we focus on the lithium manganese oxide, then there is a nickel cadmium, and then there is uh, uh, you know, iron, iron sulfate. So there are multiple chemistries of within lithium ion available. But as, as uh, of the base, I think lithium ion is one of the leading. There is some research going on sodium ion as well. From an application point of view, uh, you're right. I mean, we have used lithium ion now for our cell phone, for laptops and whatnot. And, and we have found it quite stable, quite, uh, you know, uh, uh, price effective also now. But as we move forward, we are seeing applications in the residential space. We are seeing applications in the telecom tower space. We are seeing applications in mid-size, uh, uh, you know, 50 kilowatt hour, 100 kilowatt hour type of applications. And then from a grid perspective or a utility perspective, uh, there are applications which are uh, looking for, uh, you know, requiring high, I mean, large capacity. And as again, Yogendra was saying earlier, they are looking at large capacity uh, storage, uh, which are based on lithium ion up to one megawatt hour. Terrific. So was that a yes or a no? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yogendra, I wonder if I could ask you a question around, we, we, we said 
um, distribu energy distribution or electricity distribution is in crisis. Okay, so uh, in, in the case of your company, you're a publicly listed company. Um, the regulator allows you to charge this price, and yet your because of renewable energy, your customers' usage is going down, and hence your revenue is going down. So, how do you survive as a business? It's, uh, I mean, uh, when the renewable energy is coming in and it is benefiting society and everyone, uh, we are supposed to connect them. We are supposed to maintain uh, the, the connection point for them. But are we incentivized to do anything to maintain that wire which connects the renewable energy and how long we can do that uh, without any additional thing? Now. As a public listed company, you have certain outgoing for the shareholders, stakeholders. And because of the renewable energy and because of the, uh, uh, because of the other factors with the economic conditions, outlay and other things, in Australia, we are in a peculiar situation where our demand is going a little bit down. So revenues are going down, but our peak demand is increasing. Now, in such a scenario, what is happening is that we uh, the another base for the regulatory base for uh, revenue is the asset base. Now, when the demands are not growing in a sustainable manner, we cannot actually justify economic justice for replacing the old assets. On uh, because uh, and that that means that our existing assets have to sweat more, and they have to remain in the system for longer and longer and longer. So that means we have to keep maintaining the old assets because there is no clear trend in the demand which justifies their replacement. And then as the renewal coming and when the residential uh, storage is successful, there can be uh, a, 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 a I mean, network stranded assets. So this, this puts a scenario where which is, you know, this is a vicious circle where you are seeing that customer will say, I'm being charged more, so I'll, I'll use less electricity and I'll use other methods. And then he goes out of the system, then other people ha have to be charged more for the same, you know, for the same, same uh, network. Uh, so what is happening in that, that the development which is happening in the renewal field and the storage is very healthy. What we, SP Osnet is, is, is as a distribution company is looking, that look, there's, there's, another, there's another market or there's another dimension is opening of the energy uh, system. We have to be part of it. So the, the question is regulated or deregulated, but we have to be one of the players in that. Uh, other, if we are not, someone else will be. So whether we like it or not, the, si the system is, on, as I said yesterday again, we are on a journey. Journey has begun. We are on a journey. Now, one thing we can do, we can take a very short-term look and say, I have to save my house from fire. But it, the vision, visionary people actually, most often in these times of crisis, they set the long-term things. Most of the visionary thing which you see, now you look back and say 50 years back, when there was so much crisis, somebody has actually uh, you know, put the seeds for such a big thing. And that's what I'm saying, the utility are as, at that stage. The journey has begun, we are part of it, we have to be part of it. Whether we are, we are part as a regulated business, we might be part of as a un deregul un unregulated business and we might do both. So, so that's where I see the, you know, there will be a transformation of the distribution network service provider as a company. And I think it, the company will be different in five, 10 years. So instead of uh, delivering energy via the wires, and I'm paraphrasing something, I suppose, you, you may be delivering energy services via another means. Very much so, very much so. The energy, we might be providing the energy solutions. Uh, we might be providing um, the energy services. Uh, we might be, so the comp the, we have not gone to, so far we are b business to business transactions. The companies like us, have to learn more about the customer behavior and go to business to, to, to individual customers. Sure. And that interface, to, to interface with 600,000 customers and actually provide a service to them, 
there has to be a transformation. But we, we, that's why we are doing all these trials, enome displays, residential storage trial, uh, the web portals we have for customers, individual customers. This is just to get a feel of this, this thing, what the B2C business is all about. And, and how you can earn, earn some revenue and keep the company going from that. I wonder if I could uh, move to Gavin, and Gavin, just in addition to what you covered, um, Horizon Energy has probably got more renewable um, in, in some of your uh, network than, uh, than most people in the world. Are there, are there any magic formulas that you've picked up uh, in terms of um, DMS, EMS systems to manage that effectively? I guess what we're finding is you've got to look at your, it's not so much a peak energy flow, but it's your, your lull, so your daytime lull is your, your critical point. So we might have a peak energy flow in a particular system, it might be a megawatt in summer, uh, but in the autumn or the spring in, in a Western Australian climate, the autumn is, yeah, they're, they're the times when the weather's fine, so people are not using their air conditioners or using their heaters, but the sun is shining and therefore the panels are producing 80 or 90% of their peak output. Um, and the lull might be you know, 40% in yeah. a daytime yeah. than that peak. Yeah. Um, so if you're suddenly not talking about a megawatt system that's now peaking in an in a autumn day of 400 kilowatts, um, you know, the, the 100 kilowatts of solar distributed through your system at suddenly 10% in summer is suddenly 40% in, in autumn or 30% or in autumn if you take some, some uh, slight reduction. Um, so, I guess you're coming somewhere between 10 and 15% of the total electricity generated is, is your crunch point where you have to start doing something, mm. whether it's feed-in management, whether it's uh, short-term storage and network, whether it's short-term storage at the customer, or whether it's some sort of um, um, other you know, ripple control or some, some right. control over those systems. And, and there's a lot of work being done. We're lucky in terms of we will be rolling out smart meters to most of our customers. And with that, the technology will allow you know, some of these uh, advances to come through. Right. right. Um, I've, I've got a question for you, Wei King, in, in, in a minute. But uh, is, are there any questions from the floor? Because I think we only have a... I would like to know uh, what are the technologies for, let's say, megawatt type of uh, energy storage solutions at this moment? In, in addition to what we are trying with lithium ion, the other uh, chemistry would be uh, sodium sulfur. Uh, that's something which is, uh, um, and, and uh, I guess I see Professor Palani here. Maybe he can answer that he's an expert on battery technology. But these are the two ones which we, which uh, are the most. Yeah. Yeah. This is Kai Huey from uh, BC Hydro in Canada. You asked a question earlier of uh, the gentleman from NEC about uh, storage technology. How about thinking out of the box, and I just wonder your thoughts about graphene uh, supercapacitors. So take away the chemistry, use something totally different. Do you think that's viable? Do you think that's next gen, uh, five years away, 10 years away? Um, that, that's something that's totally different than chemistry. Uh, energy storage system or a battery would still be very chemistry intensive product, uh, at least for the foreseeable future. Um, I, I guess that's the best answer I can give you. For us, the, um, when we've looked at um, supercapacitors, it's been more to do with voltage and frequency regulation. So it's that short-term burst that the gentleman in the audience was talking about, uh, not so much storing over long periods of time, but just ensuring that the network, you know, you don't have irregular power for the customers. Um, and I, and I, think, uh, I think when there is a crisis, um, technology usually comes to the fore. Um, it's, it's, it's a business driver, it's a, uh, a financial driver that will cause it to happen. And there's an awful lot of research in an awful lot of techniques and, and ways and entrepreneurs will, will create that uh, magic uh, uh, iPhone app or the whatever to, uh, to, to assist us uh, where, we, where we go. Can, so, can, I, can I add something? Yes, please. I mean, look, from our experience, from our experience, you know, like what we are looking for, there are there are people. I don't want to advertise for them, uh, but they are people who have tried lead acid with the supercapacitors. Um, so in conjunction with that, uh, so those those batteries are available. There are some batteries which operate at a 300, 400 degree C, um, you know, as a high temperature thing. So what what we as a utility we are saying the 
we want a battery which, say it is one megawatt hour, should not derate at 50 degrees C. We should get the full power. It should last for 10, 15 years. The chemistry is, is not our business. Uh, we don't understand this much, but that's what we want. What we are looking for, because having gone through this business case approval for one megawatt battery, and in fact, I know Gavin is a chartered accountant, now I know whom to talk to. Um, it, it is at the current price, it is, is still not possible to justify without subsidy. So what we are saying, the store is for network uses only, it still needs the subsidy. What we are looking for is the which technology has a future in the tipping point for the price. Unless there is a tipping point in the price, it is, it is very hard uh, you know, to, 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 to become that as a useful thing for the utilities. When we design the network for the distribution and uh, we want to use the renewable energy or uh, battery or any safety factor that I can put it in my design to uh, overcome if there is any things happen to the uh, solar or renewable energy that I have to supply from the uh, uh, capacity point of view and from economic point of view. I mean, NAC can say from their experience, but what, I'm, what we have had, had the discussion is, safety is, is, there are two things. One is safety, one is maintenance. Safety is important, and there was some explosions on the Boeing. You know, you, you, you know that you know, the, the lithium-ion battery can explode, and it's a bomb. Okay, so the, the question is, there are designs where like a cap bank, you know, there are units housed in container and then that module is housed in another container and that module housed in another container and there's a battery management system and all that kind of thing. Uh, so there are some safety features and this is when we are selecting the battery. The same questions I'll be asking with all the vendors and saying, what is your risk assessment? What is your safety features? And another thing is when the individual cells decay, or, you know, like, uh, how do I change that? How do I maintain the capacity back? You know, uh, you know, how do I keep that one megawatt hour for 10 years? So, so there are some relevant questions which I don't have an answer, uh, but I'll be asking the same questions with the manufacturers or suppliers. You change the things. If I can just add one thing to what Evinor said. I think, uh, you know, we as a vendor, we are not looking at it as just a pure battery. We are looking at it as an energy storage system, right? And that means that we have to offer a product where there is a battery management system also involved in it. So if you are taking example of lithium ion, uh, we have to make sure that we can manage at the cell level and we can monitor it. And that's the only way to make sure that the, uh, the product that we're offering is safe. Otherwise, it is a bomb, you're right. <laughs> yeah. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's, uh, thank you very much. I just put w one plug in in terms of technology. Um, we've combined uh, mainframe chip technology with the silicon chips controlling PV panels. So we've built uh, and, and have in production quarter, uh, quarter, quarter kilowatt uh, panels that are normally this big right. in, in uh, three centimetre square. Okay. And they're being tested in the Middle East, they're in production uh, around the world uh, right at the moment. That they do operate at higher temperatures and, and so forth, but, uh, but they, you, you get a quarter of a kilowatt in, in three centimetres square. <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I wonder if, uh, if you could join with me and, uh, and thank our panellists uh, uh, today. I hope you uh, got some value out of that, and I know we all agree that, uh, you know, we are at a crisis point and it's accelerating and it's not slowing down. So uh, thank you very much for your questions and your participation.